Hello, my name is John Roscombe. I'm a senior fellow of the Institute of Public Affairs and welcome to this edition of IPA Encounters with Joanna Williams. Joanna is the author of a wonderful book that we'll be talking about, How Woke Won, the elitist movement that threatens democracy, tolerance and reason. But more important than talking about how woke won, we'll be talking about how liberalism will succeed, how democracy will succeed, and how we will recapture our rights. Joanna is a prolific author and writer. She writes for Spiked Online. She's written for nearly all of the major news outlets around the world. She was an academic for a number of years and founded her own think tank, Keo, which asks the hard questions about democracy, about liberalism, talking about all those things that universities increasingly shy away from and that the media shy away from. We're delighted to be speaking with Joanna today, not just, as I said, about how woke won, but about how we can regain our freedoms. Joanna, thank you for being with us on IPA Encounters. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Can I begin by quoting from your website, which I just think is very powerful, and it sets up this discussion that I want to have about not just the origins of woke, um, but about how we as the population have reacted to some of the challenges to our freedoms and how politics has changed. So you say, all distinctions between left and right mean little today. Traditional party loyalties no longer hold sway with the electorate. And I think that's exactly the case in the UK and Australia. Public debate appears to flit through a series of seemingly random issues, freedom of speech, statues, public toilets, obesity, the purpose of schools, media representation, sexual harassment, race and racism. But as you say, a few fundamental questions underpin these talking points and we return to them repeatedly and we're going to talk about them today. What does it mean to be a man or a woman? How should we think about the past? How do we make children part of our society? Should we privilege liberty or safety, personal freedom or collective responsibility? And then you say, and this is what you explain in your book, uh, there are two schools of thought in how we deal with this. The first on one side is the view that we, the people, are stupid and bad, ignorant and deserving of pity and that we need reigning in for our own good and that politics should be left to the experts. And certainly we've heard lots of that over the last few years. On the other side, which is my view, which is the view of the IPA, which is the view of people that we've seen represented in the ballot boxes um, in recent years, is that people are rational, capable, and that we have a collective wisdom, even though we might not always have the privilege of making decisions because those decisions are made for us. And then you say, and we'll talk about populism too, populist votes speak to a desire for people to improve their lives materially, but also just as importantly to be respected and to have their voices heard. Now, Joanna, that's a wonderful introduction. What have I missed? It's funny, I'm, I'm thinking more, what have I missed? <laughs> because you're... They're your words. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, the interesting thing, you know, is I think it was a couple of years ago, actually, if I'm being completely honest, that I, I wrote that. So it's very interesting for me to hear it back and also think about what's changed, what, what if anything, would I say differently today? And, and I don't think I, I would say much differently. I think I'd probably just go even further. Um, I think what the most recent round of referendum results, and I'm, I'm thinking particularly about the, the voice uh, referendum in Australia, shows to me really that people are not just um, rational uh, and concerned about their own economic and cultural situation, as I, as I say in the piece you read, um, but are actually far more anti-racist, uh, far more progressive in terms of, of being a, a colorblind um, and wanting a, a genuinely anti-racist future. 
than the elites make us out to be. You know, I think our view, if I can say that, of the world of a, a kind of colorblind society where people are treated equally as, as individuals on the basis of their character, on their merit, rather than being judged according to their skin color. Um, I think that has come so much more to the fore in the past 18 months. So I think if I was going back and rewriting that today, I think I'd go even further and really emphasize that point. And, and so, Joanna, that is such a powerful idea that we are to be judged on our character, that we are we should be colorblind. But as you write, to say that we should be colorblind is now to be interpreted as a statement of racism. Can you explain that and then talk about how have we got to the stage where to say that we should ignore skin color is claimed to be a statement of racism? It's really a shocking thing when you put it like that. And you think of the um, civil rights movements that were taking place across the world, really, but obviously centered upon America in the 1960s. And you think, are we seriously supposed to think that these movements made no political gains whatsoever, that that was all a complete waste of time? But the founding principles of those movements, it seems to me, were really about taking people as individuals, um, looking at what equality would actually mean uh, and moving away from seeing skin colour um, as being the most important factor in a person's life. It should be something that's completely irrelevant. You know, it's certainly something we have no control over. It's something we just happen to be born with. And the idea that this one feature of our biology becomes the determining factor is is to me, it's just such a regressive move, but it nicely illustrates, I think, the political arc that we've taken over the past really 70 years, where we've moved from a much more progressive stance of, of not trying to focus on skin colour to now making it the most important thing. And we've been told that this is a progressive move and it's completely regressive. As you talk about in How Woke One, uh, you discuss that that move almost enshrines a perpetual bureaucracy. It enshrines a job for diversity consultants forever. And you mentioned The Voice previously, and in Australia, a major argument for The Voice was that this would lead to reconciliation, however defined, but we were never told when we would be reconciled? Is it a permanent process? Can we look forward to an end of it? And is that one of the things that's happening that as the world becomes less racist, we have to look for racism? Well, I think we do, but I think I think the problem is well. When I say we, I think the elites are doing that. You know, this this exactly this this EDI bureaucracy. You know, their very jobs depend upon it. They're incentivized to find racism. If they turn around tomorrow and say, well, do you know what? We've, we've solved this problem. Um, we, we've tackled racism. We've ended it. Hooray. You know, they are out of a job. And this is not just one or two people we're talking about now, but a substantial sector of the workforce, I would say, who are now financially incentivized in uh, finding racism everywhere. But I think, you know, what strikes me is it's not just about them finding racism. I think more fundamentally, they're actually creating racism. You know, they're not just looking for little pockets where maybe some backward bigot says something. And obviously this does still happen. You know, we've had a very recent case in the UK um, where people do say really off offensive and outrageous things. But I think far more fundamentally, they're creating racism because they are setting uh, black people to a lower moral and intellectual standard. Essentially, they're saying that without their help, you can't have this uh, situation of equality, that, that as black people are victims, you know, they need um, extra help and support. So if you take the voice referendum, essentially, it seems to me what they're saying is that indigenous communities are not capable of um, kind of reaching maturity in effect 
of, of acting as equal citizens without these extra special um, provisions made for them. To me, that's incredibly insulting. You know, that's a real, uh, well, racist statement. You know, you're saying that you've got groups of two groups of people who are intellectually and morally distinct. And, and that's uh, that's an incredibly racist statement to make. So. And it overturns every notion of liberal democracy. And in, in the book, you talk about race and then... In a very powerful chapter, you talk about gender and feminism and you draw the same parallels as to what elites are doing to women. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the book I wrote before was Women Versus Feminism and I wrote that in about 2015, 2016 and it kind of shows a bit of a personal journey for me as well, I guess, because in that book I'm very, very critical of feminism and the way feminist movements were going um, in the West around Me Too and turning women into victims. Uh, but what I didn't really uh, um, grasp enough at that stage was the extent to which the whole idea of what it means to be a woman was going to be called into question. The idea of defending single sex spaces for women it was something which I, luckily enough, as as a young woman growing up, you know, I just took completely for granted uh, equal rights with men, but also uh, kind of the fact that I was a woman, that this was a meaningful concept, um, that, you know, heaven forbid, if I did something wrong, if I went to prison, it would be a single sex prison. If I needed a, a hospital appointment, it would be on a single sex hospital ward. And the idea of now having to fight for all those basic rights again, the idea that these fundamental rights, sex-based rights, have been undermined to such an extent that they need to be refought for. I mean, again, it just it not only does it blow my mind personally, but it's a real illustration of how progressive politics is racist, it's sexist, it's homophobic, and, and it needs to be called out for all of these things. Can I then talk to you and ask you about something you've just said when you mentioned the need to fight for something. So something that I've long argued is that um, liberals, Democrats, liberal Democrats, uh, those who believe in liberal democracy, um, have forgotten how to fight for freedom of speech because we assumed we would always have it. We have forgotten how to mount the argument for equality. We've forgotten the power of the argument for democracy. Is it the case that a lot of things we took for granted, we just stopped fighting for and there were others who were wanting to fight against it or was something else happening? Yeah, I think I think there's certainly a, a degree of truth in what you're saying that that we took these things for granted and gave up. But I think whilst we were doing that, um, I think there's also been a much bigger transformation where uh, suddenly when I was, I mean, making myself out to be very old now. I don't think I'm, I'm that old. But when I was at university, you know, being free, pro free speech was considered to be a left wing position. You know, it was considered something that if you were even vaguely on the left, you know, you supported women's rights, you um, you were pro free speech, you were pro personal freedom as well, I think to a much greater extent than people are today. And I think what's happened in the intervening kind of 30 years, you know, so we're not talking a huge period of time historically, is that these um, values have swung around to become right wing values or perceived as being right wing values. So when I say some of the things that I would have said, you know, exactly 30 years ago, if I could say word for word, the exact same thing. And, you know, 30 years ago, I'd have been considered extremely left wing. And now I'm considered extremely right wing, you know, for saying the exact same thing. So I think that's the extent where people have uh, people on the left, you know, have not just taken their eye off the ball and and kind of forgotten or taken for granted these things, but they've actually come to disown them. You know, they the people on the left don't want to have anything to do with these values anymore. It just it seems bizarre to me, and people will say this quite explicitly, that free speech, you know, oh, it's a bit of a dog whistle, which is a horrible phrase, you know, because who are they calling dogs when they say that? But what they're meaning is, oh, you know, it, it 
it smells a bit dodgy. There's something, why would you want free speech, essentially, is what they're saying, that the only reason why you would make an argument for free speech is because you're wanting to say something offensive. You know, you're wanting to um, say something which is out of order. You're wanting to upset someone. Exactly. Yeah. And and that I think that's the big, big change, you know, and, and so so I think not only do we have to um, get back into the fight, you know, and actually make make the case yet again for free speech, for single sex spaces, for colorblind anti-racism. Um, but I think we also have to say that, that there's nothing right wing, inherently right wing about these positions. You know, we have to. Um, make the case that these are progressive, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in the in the true sense of the word. You know, this is much better to live in a society that has these values than doesn't. There's nothing suspicious or uh, smelly about them. And I'm going to ask you in a moment about how we do get back into the fight. But before I do that, I want to talk about a couple of aspects of how woke won. And there's a very powerful discussion that you have about the origins of woke, because sometimes it's the case um, that we describe woke as a variant of Marxism and that it's all the Frankfurt School and that it's all a product of French philosophers. But you say something, you say, look, it's partly that as well, but you say there's other reasons at play as well. And I just thought I'd like to read out a section and then ask you to talk about it because it's on the defenders of Western civilization, which so much of the responsibility falls. And so you say, some argue that woke values took off in universities due to the dominance of critical theory in postmodernism. But this can make it seem as if these ideas won out because of their sheer intellectual strength or because their adherents achieved success through a Gramsci-inspired long march through the institutions. And then you say, in reality, the ascendancy of woke has less to do with the intellectual authority of critical theorists and more to do with the abject failure of an intellectual elite to defend enlightenment values such as rationality, reason, liberty, progress and tolerance. Even in the 1960s, radical young scholars often found themselves pushing at an open door. And then this final sentence I found very powerful. An older generation of professors no longer had the confidence to maintain traditional scholarly principles, which they saw as tainted following the experience of war in general and the Holocaust in particular. So can we date a lot of this from the Second World War? You know what, I think we can, absolutely. And um, uh, interesting, you know, sorry to a little bit of an anecdote here, us, but I was watching a film last night with my daughter and it was, uh, it's called Kill Your Darlings. I can recommend it, it's a good film. Um, it's about the beat poets in the US uh, looking at, it, it's a kind of biographical film around uh, Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs, you, 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 uh, Jack Kerouac. It's it's all about the, the kind of their lives, how they met and how they got together before becoming famous for Howl and On the Road and Naked Lunch and this kind of thing. Um, and it is set in exactly that period, you know, the time they were getting together, the time they were uh, coming up with their ideas was not just um, after the Second World War, but but actually during, you know, these, these guys met at university uh, in the 19, uh, 1943, 1944, and then it's the aftermath of that. Uh, and I think what's interesting is two things. First of all, how, how early this is, and I think it becomes too easy and almost lazy for us to write all of this off as the kind of the horror of the 1960s. And actually, historically, you do need to think a bit more, um, have a bit more historical nuance than that. But I think what's interesting is, first of all, how early this was, like I said, what really was the 1940s when people were starting to come up with these ideas, but also you know, the fact that at, at that point, you know, these guys, they were the counterculture, you know, they were the ones who were really pushing back and challenging the stifling conventions of the time in, in terms of what was expected of, of in academia, in terms of literary conventions. 
Interestingly enough, they were the ones who were fighting for free speech, to go back to what we were saying. And as students, they didn't want to have at the university to have in loco parentis responsibilities over them. They wanted to be treated as young adults, which kind of makes me laugh. Sorry, I'm a bit diversion here. But, you know, you look at what goes on in university campuses today with the colouring books, you know, the um, stress relieving teepees you can go and sit in at exam time. Well, you. You write about the dangers of psychotherapy and about the idea that young people need to be safe. Is that is that something that's happened? Oh, and what, completely. What's the and of that? and the thing that upsets me is often this is now by the time they get to university seems to be coming from students themselves. This perception that they just really can't cope with the world. They can't cope with debate. They they find ideas hurtful that that exams are going to be far too much for them to cope with and they need, you know, a llama to pet, a dog to walk, a book to colour in, in order to be able to get through these things. But again, going back to the the beat poets, you know, the positive thing about that was they were rejecting all of that. They were saying to the kind of adults around them, butt out, leave us alone, we're adults, we want to push back. But I think what happened in a very short space of time was that these countercultural figures of the 1940s, they became the dominant culture. They became the people in charge. So by the 1960s, you know, you've got your Jack Kerouac, Alan Alan Ginsberg, William Burroughs. You know, these are the people who are then, not literally, but, you know, these are the people who are being looked up, certainly literally being looked up to in the culture. You know, these are the icons. Um, but, But their generation and people with their ideas are the ones who are running the universities, who are running the literature departments. And the, their ideas then are, are the ones that are coming to the fore. But it is, it's the professors in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, who, who were completely unable to hold a line. You know, they, when your Allen Ginsberg started challenging them, you know, they're holding up the white flag. They, they are not able to make the case for the intellectual merits of, of Western civilization. And I think that's what we've seen kind of and still do today. You know, every every decade that's passed, we've lost more confidence in the um, morals and the intellectual gains of Western civilization to the point now where we see it being trashed at every available opportunity. You know, it's not enough just to criticize it. We have to tear down the statues. We have to burn the books. We have to um, trash the people who did try to maintain this legacy. How how do you feel being a revolutionary saying, don't burn books, don't tear down statues? Did you ever think you would be cast in this role? (laughs) You know, it's funny because um, to hear you say that and to use that particular word revolutionary, because, you know, I I was a revolutionary. I mean, when I was at university, it was the Revolutionary Communist Party that I joined believe it or not, you know. and, and What happened, and, Joanna? This is some change. Well, you see, it's not. I, I don't think it is because I think actually I am still a revolutionary. <laughs> but for all the reasons that you say, you know, what's becoming revolutionary now in terms of challenging the dominant trends in our institutions is actually to make the case for the gains of Western civilization. And, and I mean that in, in all levels, actually, to defend marriage, you know, as a, a family unit, to um, defend... To defend the working class, to say there's value in Absolutely. manual work. No, I think so, totally. And, and, you know, again, to come back to the voice referendum, to come back to the Brexit referendum that we've had in the UK, you know, this is why I would defend populism. It's it's a defence of the working class and a defence of uh, working class people's rights to dictate the, the course of the societies that they live in. Uh, so I think I do have some of that revolutionary spirit that I had as a teenager, I like to think I do still carry with me today, even though, you know, it might look to the outside world that what I'm um, professing is a conservative position. I think actually the conservative position is the revolutionary position now. So, Joanna, when did the Labor Party abandon 
labourers? When did it leave? When did the left leave the working class? I mean, I think a really a significant point in the UK was with the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1979, and I think it was the the response that the how the left responded to that throughout the 1980s uh, that's really set in place the rejection of the working class as a positive political force. I think they looked with horror at Margaret Thatcher, but looked at, at even more horror at the working class people who'd um, put her in this position. It's almost as if like the disgust and contempt. So one of the policies that Margaret Thatcher um, put in place uh, that, that's been talked about repeatedly since was the capacity for people who lived in a council house to be able to buy that their their property to be able to buy the council house. And you could see sections of the left. It's almost like suddenly this disgust, like what, we're going to let these people kind of own their own houses as if this is an inherently bad aspiration even that that people would want to own this. You know, don't they like living in um, council-owned houses? You know, isn't this kind of morally better? And, and this shock that working class people wanted a better life, didn't want to be victims, wanted to earn money, wanted to own their own house. You know, that that kind of distaste really came to the fore then. And it's snobbery, you know, it's it, because they weren't suggesting going to live in council houses or queuing up for food banks. You know, they just like the working class people to behave in this way. So I think what happened was that um, after kind of rejecting the working class, the left was looking around for new constituencies it could appeal to. And I think this is where you really get identity politics taking off, because when you've rejected the working class as an electoral force, turning to um, different groups based on skin colour, uh, sex, sexuality, you know, that kind of makes sense. You know, these are the people you're going to appeal to. But it creates a very uh, divisive form of politics where you're setting different groups of people against each other. Um, and it again, it, it unleashes the potential for all kinds of, of snobbery and disdain for the working class, which is the one movement, the one group of people that I think actually can unite across colour, sex, lines. Uh, it does away with that uh, and reinforces divisions in society instead. And then talking about snobbery, Joanna, for you, what is populism? I think it's become one of these words that's almost become associated with race, like along the line, the same kind of prism with racism, sexism, homophobia. It's become a kind of boo word, you know, an inherently bad thing in and of itself as if uh, you can end an argument just by saying, oh, populism, and you don't need to give any further explanation. That's the end of the argument in and of itself. Um, But for me, you know, it just means involving the populace. Um, involving people, letting people have a say over the future of the shape of the society that they want to live in. I guess the most um, obvious form this takes is in general elections, but even more, you see it working even more clearly in referendums. And I think we've had a few, obviously, the last few years really have been shaped by referendums in a number of countries. The UK, by Brexit, I mean, It's hard to think that this is getting on for almost 10 years now uh, since we had the Brexit vote in the UK. Yeah, I think it's probably still one of the number one um, factors shaping and the the way the elite responded to that and, and attempts to row it back. Attempts that what concerns me about the prospect of us having a Labour Party in the not too distant future in the UK is um, they take the Brexit result very, very personally. And it's almost as if they want to put in place, they're already planning and seem to be discussing uh, ways of making sure nothing like this can ever happen again. So, you know, how can we um, parcel off power to um, unelected groups within society, such as the Bank of England, for example, or um, set up uh, groups that are not democratically accountable so that if power doesn't lie within the EU, we can create power within the judiciary or power within, like I said, the Bank of England, so that when people do vote, their vote doesn't count for as much as it might have done otherwise. What does that do to trust? What does that do 
to accountability. What does that do to transparency, all the things that the left once championed? Yeah, absolutely. A really, really important question because I think the very, very opposite to what they intended to do. When they give power to the judiciary or give, when they, I mean, the, the kind of, it would be the Labour Party, um, although the Conservative Party have certainly done their best to go down this line as well. When they hand power over to these unelected groups, they, they, use the language of trust to um, justify their decisions to do this. They seem to imply that this will enhance trust in the system. And the, in, the implication of that is that clearly we can't trust elected politicians. You know, we can't trust what, and the, the big kind of horror that the left throw up now is, is also, well, what if we get another Boris Johnson? <laughs> um, or Donald you know, Trump. Exactly. Yeah, this this is exactly the point they make. So, you know, we couldn't trust an elected politician to be in charge of the country's economy. So we need to bring in groups like, you know, the World Health Organization in case of pandemics or um, the Bank of England in terms of monetary policy or the judiciary in terms of, of you know, what's a hate crime or not a hate crime. And, and this is done with a view to building trust in the system. But I think the problem is it, it does end up having completely the opposite effect because we've seen some shocking examples even quite recently of where the police and judges have been very biased in the decisions that they've made, particularly around the kind of pro-Palestine um, protests that have been taking place. And then suddenly it dawns on people that we have no power to get these people out, to get these people out of office. You know, our vote counts for less. Um, if I hate the prime minister, the, the my, my local MP, you know, I, it can be really frustrating. I might have to wait four or five years, but eventually I can go and put a cross on that piece of paper and get them out and I can spend the intervening time convincing enough other people to do the same. If I don't like the judiciary, if I don't like the people who are making health policies or um, monetary policy, I can't do anything about it at all. So it's really um, disempowering to the public and it doesn't create trust at all. It, it undermines trust. So to look to the future, this year 2024 has been regarded as the year of elections. What has been the reaction in the UK to the potential for outbreaks of populist revolution around the world? as people get to vote. Yes, absolutely. Horror, I would say, coming from our elite. Um, I'm just listening to the BBC this morning, exactly this point about elections taking place all around the world. It's just been announced there'll be an election in India as well. Um, the biggest um, population going to, to vote. To me, this is like a huge cause for celebration. This is the biggest exercise, in, the biggest dem exercise of democracy that the world will have ever seen. You know, this is an amazing feat of human achievement that we've created these societies and these systems where we're letting people all around the world have a say in the future shape of the society we live in. Yet to hear this discussed on the BBC, uh, you think that this was kind of fascism breaking out, you know, and, and this is the most terrible thing. It's interesting. Obviously, they can't say, you know, democracy is, is a terrible thing. So what they do say, and, and again, this was literally just on the BBC before I started recording, um, the, we're just talking with you this morning, um, they, they will say, all these elections taking place and then there's like a heartbeat and they say, so how can we stop the rise of, of um, misinformation and disinformation and the growth of artificial intelligence manipulating the election result? You know, all these dangers that there are. It can't just be an inherently good thing. There are all these dangers that come with it. And of course, you know, the implication of that is the general public, we are so stupid 
that we just look at a, a tweet or a, we see a, a meme or something like this, and we're going to, all right, I'm going to forget everything I ever believed, forget everything I've ever thought or read or known about. Hmm, this meme is so convincing. Uh, I'm going to completely change who I was planning to vote for. You know, it it sounds as if it's a high level discussion about the news and news output and the media. It's not. It's just a very thinly veiled way of saying, oh, my God, we're having this all these elections taking place and the general public are so stupid. They're clearly going to make the wrong decision. In the second part of How Woke One, you talk about the future and you outline the causes for optimism and the potential for change. So you're talking about, for example, the power of spiked online, the power of different news outlets, uh, bloggers of now, the potential of Substack to change the debate and not be controlled by the mainstream media gatekeepers. Can you talk a little bit about that and even uh, your experience with um, Keo and your experience with Spiked Online. Yeah, I, you know, I think this is a very, very good thing that it does allow more diverse um, voices to get out there. And we hear so much panic as well about um, social media and um, the internet in general, particularly in relation to young people. But I think as a way of um, bypassing uh, mainstream media gatekeepers, and actually saying, you know, that you don't have the right to dictate the narrative um, and the way that people understand things, that people can have access to information and opinion uh, more directly is a really powerful force for good. Um, you know, I think these people who run mainstream media news outlets they've only themselves to blame they've undermined trust in themselves which you know i have no sympathy with them whatsoever you know completely hold them responsible for bringing about this situation um but at the same time i do think the lack of trust is a problem and i think it's great that there are new sources of of information and opinion now and i think i definitely think this is a really powerful and necessary i think more than anything necessary a uh, force for change but i also think you know that it, that it perhaps is a problem for the future that um we are far, far more uh, in silos nowadays it's easier far more easy with something like substack for example and twitter or x you know to just subscribe and just hear reinforced back to you um your own opinion um and i, I think you know, this is something that the media, mainstream media, need to take responsibility for because they do it just as much. You know, they put back to us one dominant narrative. And I think that's a huge problem because it's when the times I've learned most in life have really been when I've not been talking to people who agree with me, but when I've been talking to people who disagree with me and, and when that forces you to think through, well, why do I think this? You might not change your mind, but you you have to really think through your arguments. And I think there's a, a bit of a danger that we get into increasingly get into silos of, of only hearing the same opinions but but like I said, I think this is I put the blame for this with the mainstream media. Does that then mean that there's a danger in creating separate institutions? So this is part of the emerging debate, for example, in relation to universities. Can mainstream government funded public universities be encouraged to now have diversity of views or are universities, for example, too far gone and we need to set up new universities, so you've spent a lot of your life writing and researching about universities, you've published books about the future of the university. What's what's your view? Yeah, it's a really, really difficult one. And I don't think there's something which, it, the, I don't think there's an easy answer to this. I guess at risk of sounding like I'm sitting on the fence for once in my life, I think it has to be both, not either or. You know, I think we definitely need new institutions. We need new universities, new media outlets. 
But I don't think we should just give up on the ones that already exist as well. I think we also need to be um, campaigning for change and, and making arguments from within existing structures too. Um, you know, for a number of reasons, I think, uh, you know, why should we just let them off the hook? You know, and, and there's a real... Um, kind of problem with with kind of economic power and cultural power and clearly the universities um, institutions like the BBC in the UK you know these are this is where the money is as well as where the cultural power is and it becomes that much harder it's it's great that you have things like Substack and people can set up their own websites but you're never going to have the the funding that comes from um, government grants that go into universities, the, the student loan system, you know, you need major political change to level up the the economic. Can um, you see the potential for that major political change? So in the UK, the Tories have been in power for 14 years and they seem to me to have spent the last year or two complaining about things that they've had the power to change for more than a decade. Can you see that change politically coming? You know, it's hard. Some days I wake up and I feel very optimistic. Some days I wake up and I feel very pessimistic. You're absolutely right. I mean, uh, the word woke didn't even exist when the Conservatives first came into office. I mean, I'm sure it did. It did technically exist. But, you know, the, the whole real kind of um, entrenchment of woke ideology within UK institutions has happened under a Conservative government. And now we're they face electoral wipeout later this year, if current polling's to be correct, and I've no reason to really think it's not, uh, and a Labour government. And a Labour government without any money that's only going to be able to exercise cultural power and can we know there are lots of people within the Labour Party who are desperate to do things like introducing bans on on um conversion therapy which could potentially even criminalise parents who um, want to tell their child who tells them they're transgender, you know, let's just wait and see, sweetheart, and see how you feel in a couple of years' time, could criminalise parents for behaviour like that. That makes me feel very pessimistic. I guess where I feel more cause for optimism, though, is just looking at how quickly things can change. Um, politically. And I think this has been brought home to me so much within my own lifetime. You know, when I think I, even just things that we've been talking about already, um, you know, how completely different politically the world is now from the world I grew up in. Uh, again, to repeat, you know, I'm not that old, um, you know, and yet it looks politically the landscape could not be more different but even in a to give a much more concrete example in a much shorter period of time, you know, if somebody had told me in 2000, Britain will vote to leave the EU and this will happen. We will leave the EU. I would not have believed that, you know, if somebody had told me in 2006, Britain will vote to leave the EU. I, it just seemed like it was such an entrenched thing. It seemed absolutely impossible to imagine um, that there was any way or means of making this happen at all. And then 10 years later, you know, that's happened. And you look at somebody like Trump in the US, you know, I'm not always the massive fan of Trump, but he does show that change is possible. And and I think you see the same in the UK right now as well, where people are... Um, I've heard the phrase so many times where people describe themselves as politically homeless. You know, people just feel no affinity, no loyalty to either of the two major political parties. And for the first time, you are seeing really the rise of some new political parties. Uh, there's the Reform Party, which uh, Nigel Farage kind of emerged, uh, is associated with and emerged out of the Brexit Party. Um you know, is becoming uh, much more of a political force to be reckoned with. It's not, um, it becomes very difficult because we've got the first past the post system. So for a third party to break through uh, is difficult. But, but when you have a collapse in support for your traditional parties, 
this is not impossible to imagine. Certainly for the first time in my life, I can imagine that a political party that doesn't even exist now could be in government, not this year, but, you know, in five years, in 10 years, you could things could look completely different. And, and it seems from afar, from Australia looking at the UK model, that those new parties talk about culture. They talk about our history, heritage. They talk about the role of families. From your perspective, why do you think it's been that traditional conservative parties have been reluctant to engage in that discussion and they've just focused on economics and by and large they haven't even done economics that well? Yeah, I think that's true. Um, that's certainly true about the economics. Unfortunately, on the culture, you know, I, I guess I disagree with you a little bit. It's not that they've not wanted to go there. It's that they've gone there in completely the wrong direction. Um, they're not traditional conservative parties. You know, when we had Theresa May as prime minister, for example, um, disastrous, I think one of the worst prime ministers um, the UK's ever, ever had. And Theresa May was falling over herself to introduce uh, gender self-identification. Um, you know, this this was not a Labour Party thing. They have certainly um, sidetracked the debate and, and opted out on lots of occasions, but they've also been at the forefront of actually pushing some of this legislation through. You know, and it, it, you look at the changes that have occurred within schools and universities, the massive growth of the diversity bureaucracy within our NHS. You know, these are things which the Conservative Party have not just ignored, but have actually allowed to happen. They've actually, in some cases, created the legal system um, for it to happen. So I think one of the biggest things shaping life, not, I mean, I'm sure not just in the UK, but in many countries around the world right now, again, I blame Theresa May for this, not just Theresa May, but it was on her watch. We're tied into this commitment to net zero, um, legally binding, again, parceled off to all these different non-governmental organisations to oversee the imposition of net zero. So we have crazy targets for rubbish heat pumps, electric cars, things that don't work, you know, don't heat your house as effectively. Um, make getting anywhere far more difficult. Nobody asked us, you know, there was no, I, I, if I was standing for prime minister, if I was standing in the next election, I think I would put my number one policy would be referendum on net zero. And I would like to see that in every country around the world, have it, take, put that to the people and make it an honest debate, actually spell out, you know, this is what achieving net zero means in terms of your life. Um, for this much potential gain in terms of, you know, we could reduce the temperature across the globe by 0.0001%. And in order to achieve that, your house will be colder, you will be poorer, people will die younger, you will be hungry, you know, and, and actually spell out to people what the consequences that are. My, my, my view is people are not daft, they will reject this. And that's precisely why these things are pushed through. In the UK, there wasn't even a debate in Parliament about this legally binding net zero target. They didn't even have a vote. They all just shouted, yes, and that was it. It was nodded through. And here in Australia, Joanna, exactly the same situation prevails when the Liberal National Coalition opposed legislated net zero targets, they won elections. As soon as Scott Morrison unilaterally adopted them, they lost elections. It counted not a jot for them. They got no electoral advantage whatsoever. Can I ask you two final questions? What are we to do as citizens in a world of, of these changes? What can we do as, as individuals to fight for our freedom, stand up for our liberties and defend liberal democracy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a difficult one. I think be a bit braver, you know, say what you think um, and, and exercise that freedom. And it's, I, I, I'm not saying this lightly, I know it is a difficult thing, but I think one of the biggest problems that we face perhaps now is um, not necessarily legal restrictions on free speech, um, although in the UK there are a lot of legal restrictions on free speech, 
But you, when you start, um, when word gets round about these legal restrictions, you have a culture then of almost of self censorship where people become fearful of saying the wrong thing, even when it's not against the law, even when saying what you think won't um, bring you up against the police. People overinterpret, and some of this comes from workplaces and educational institutions, this idea that you should self-censor, that you should um, overinterpret the law in these areas. And you know, you, you shouldn't say anything even that's going to upset people. I mean, again, um, even just listening to the news earlier today, again, the BBC, they're bringing somebody on about these pro-Palestine marches which are taking place through London and, and major cities in the UK and, and across the world as well. I, I think they are the most despicable, horrible. I, I wish these marches did not happen. You know, they offend me enormously. But... I would also defend the rights of these people to march, you know, hating every single thing that they say, their right to carry those placards, to say those things, I think is important. So we had um, a police officer in, interviewed on the BBC um, this morning um, talking about these marches. And um, he was saying ultimately that most of the people on the marches are not breaking any laws. But he said then, but they need to know that what they're saying is going to upset people. And so you shouldn't say it anyway, because it will upset people. And, you know, like I say, hating these marches, hating every single thing these marches represented, it still made me cross that you would seek to limit free speech on the basis of, well, it upsets people. Because you don't stop people thinking things that might upset others. You just stop them saying it. And you just encourage this culture of, of self-censorship. And again, it, it, it stops us trusting one another. It makes us suspicious. Well, what do you really think? And it stifles debate. It stifles democracy. It, it stifles getting bad ideas out there so that we can argue back against them. Final question, Joanna, after a wonderful discussion. Thank you. How do we win the next generation for freedom? How do we talk to young people? about liberty and about Western civilization and the heritage of our freedoms? You know, I think this is a, such an important question. I, again, you know, some days I feel very optimistic, some days I don't. So I, I have um, three children now who are kind of late teens, early 20s. Um, when I look at them and their um, friends, their cohort, I, I'm assuming they're fairly representative. It, I think it's not being completely squashed. I think within them, there is something that, that wants to, a very positive aspect of, of just, I think of just human nature um, for being a young person, where there's an appetite that you want to experiment, you know, whether that's with bad things like drugs and alcohol and cigarettes or travel, good things, you know, travel and, a, a kind of a, a bit of a libertarian spirit, I think, exists in all teenagers and, and young adults. I think what we do as a society, as, as an older generation of adults, that's so terrible is we scare them out of this. You know, we bombard them with messages that, you know, you're going to this will have bad consequences. I think not just for your uh, physical health, which I think all teenagers and young adults have a sense of their own invincibility. And I think that's still true now. You know, they're going to take physical risks because they don't they don't think about their mortality, which becomes more of a thing as you get older. Um, but I think what we do that's so terrible is we scare them with um, worries about their mental health. You know, do this and you're going to become anxious. You're going to become depressed. It will be bad for your mental health. So I think the number one thing we've got to do, I think we don't need to really do anything to cultivate that spirit of, of libertarianism that exists within young people. I think that is there as a product of being a teenager. I think what we've got to do is stop scaring it out of them. We've got to stop telling young people through school, through media, through social media, through campaigns that they are fragile, um, that they are emotionally vulnerable, that, that their number one 
one priority has got to be sitting in their bedroom meditating or sitting at the t- kitchen table doing coloring books or going for a walk listening to a mindfulness app you know that is not a good way to live if you're a normal healthy um, teenager you know you need to get out there in the world you need to experience life think about other people think about the world you know that's a much more exciting um, and potentially liberating thing to do than retreating into your bedroom because you're scared of, of what it might do so don't do anything but stop for heaven's sake stop scaring young people into thinking that they're ill joanna that's a wonderful note on which to finish this episode of encounters thank you so much for being with us it's been an absolute pleasure i've really enjoyed talking to you thank you for having me